Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Sega Dental Experts mini webinar series, um, which is being broadcast across many continents. My name's Graeme Turner. I'm um, based in Sydney, Australia at a Sega head office, and we've got some very special guests from all around the world um, who I will introduce to you shortly. I'd like to first just give a little bit of background around who a Sega is. So we, for those that, that for those of you that don't know, a Sega began back in, we formed back in 2007 and we launched our first product in 2011. And it was only until the, um, around 2015 when we started to install systems into dentistry. Um, the, in 2017, we came across a page on Facebook called the Sega Dental Experts Group. And that was founded by um, Matthias Zimmer, who's with us today. And as a former, and that group has grown significantly over the years. And it's been a very important part of our development in dentistry. Um, we, Sega manufactures 3D printers across multiple industries and dentistry being one of those, we can't be specialists in all of those industries. So we rely on user and customer feedback to help develop our products and improve them and make them, you know, the best that we can make them. And we've taken a lot from the dental experts group. So this webinar today is a form of a, it's a, it's a way to say thank you to Matthias and all of the group members in the dental experts group on Facebook, we really value your support as a manufacturer and we enjoy many years to come on how we can improve our products for digital dentistry. So on with us tonight, we've got lots of special guests. So everybody, please share your, please share your cameras. And just to add a little bit more about Matthias, um, he, he founded the group in 2017 and there's now over eight and a half thousand members, which is just staggering for us. It's a really fantastic um, achievement. So tonight we have with us Ashley Burns from Burns Dental Laboratory in the UK. We have Marcus Menzinski from um, a, a very well-known laboratory in Iceland. We have Tanya Little from Envision and Envision den Denture and Implants um, Clinic. I've, oh gosh, have I got that right? In Canada. And Min Tran from Dental Tech Tips. So everybody say good day. Hello. <laughs> so, Matthias, I'm going to hand over to you now to um, have just to explain how this began. Like, the, we, I think in I think we weren't aware of the dental experts page for around six months. It, you went undetected under the radar for, <laughs> for many months because we hadn't realized that there was such a following on Facebook. Yes. And then when we, when we came to learn about the experts group, that's when we became to know each other. And it was a really, we, a Sega, just so everybody's clear, a Sega has no involvement. We don't manage or control no. that group. That's a purely user driven group. Yes. Um, so, Matthias, um, I yeah. think it was uh, 2017, um, just roundabout. And um, we have, um, in the past, we have started with a Pro 2K. This was our, our first printer uh, at this time. And um, I have known um, uh, Stefan Weiss, yes, Dr. Stefan Weiss. He's yeah, in, in 3D Access, um, the German support. And um, we have known each other also and uh, get support. And I'm always on the searching for um, to connect dental techs together. Yes. And um, nothing is so easy as to connect the guys and the people on the Facebook together. Um, you get mm. fast support to each other. You can have, um, if you have a problem, just post it and you will get so many answers and so many feedback. Um, you can do this better, just try this and uh, try that. And um, Aziga never has been involved uh, to manage this group, like you said. And um, I think this is the, the best way to get um, the, the things forward, yes, just to have. Uh, the best for the guys uh, out there to have the, the best technology and uh, the best resins and um, to get the things forward also. I think this is 
the, the main 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 um, in, in then intent from from me also yes and so I think it's the best uh, thing we can uh, do for the customers also yes yeah I think on that group we've there's everything from the good the bad and the ugly and I think that's yeah. sort of important because there's you know you can see the the output of the units you can see the like common issues that ha that occur with our users um, and really it's then a yeah, it's a great community everyone sort of dives in and helps everybody out it's um not just when they're having issues it's just about improving workflows and just making yes. everybody's <clears throat> experience better yes, so, yes. yes that's the thing also yes not the, not only the issues yet and i think also um 3d printing is also a thing you have to think about it yes you you have uh, to 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 think like the printer i would say um it's not um, anything you just click and uh, and and paste the stl um, on the printer you have just when um, you're nesting something you have think about it and um this is not uh, this is it has to i think it's is the thing we, we we have to do it now yes mm. yeah yeah, great. Um, and with, with um, I forgot to mention just at the start, just some, just before we begin with our with our speakers, just for everybody who has questions for our speakers to send those in, and we will cover those as a as a Q and A session in a Q and A session right at the end of the webinar. We've got some prizes to give away, some lucky dip prizes. Um, so just use the the chat. Um, or the Q&A section in the Zoom app, and we'll do our best to get to cover those at the end of the um, webinar. Um, we've got Corey Lambertson also on with us today, and Ken, Ken Wong, who manage our US office, uh, which is a new office for a SEGA out in um, Ann Arbor in Michigan. And we're very pleased to have that office. We, we have three offices globally now. We've got a head office where all of our engineering and manufacturing products assembly lines in Sydney. We've got a German office where, which manages the Europe um, regions and you know, um, surrounding, um, surrounding countries. And then we've got our US office in North America that um, handles both the North America and the, the South American countries. So Corey, say good day. Hey guys, thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you, Matthias. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you for putting this group together. It has been a, uh, the dental experts page has been a fountain of, of knowledge for all of our users. And like Ram said, you get to see the great, the bad and the ugly, uh, but it, it's unfiltered content and unfiltered knowledge that all of our users have. And it's, it's been phenomenal. Uh, a little bit about our, U our U.S. office. We're actually under wraps of completing the office, and so now we're just getting furniture in, and our U.S. office will be a, I call it a safe space for all of our, all of our partners and our customers, but ultimately it's going to be an excellent training facility, and a, we'll have a showroom, and we'll be hosting events here at Asiga America, and I would love to see some of our experts uh, in at our facility and, and get to play with the printers with us. And uh, also, I'd like to introduce Ken. Uh, Ken Wong. He's actually my. He's I call him my right hand man, my sidekick, my uh, the the organized side to Asiga America. <laughs> uh, and uh, Ken, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, happy to be here. Uh, and yeah, I'll be here in America. I'm running technical support and some marketing things here. Uh, it's been a really fun time learning through the Sega machine. Uh, it's been it's a, been a fantastic experience with working, uh, seeing the uh, really beautiful products that it makes. So excited uh, to be here and help everyone out. Cool. Now, I was going to say, I know there's something special that's going to happen at the end of the, uh, the, the series of uh, speakers, Graham, do we want to talk about that the the special activity that's going to happen right at the end? The the lucky dip prizes. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got some giveaway, some giveaway, some products um, that we'll we'll go through and we'll we'll pick out um, across the um, we'll pick out some lucky people. There's three prizes to give away. Um, we can go through. We'll, we'll present the details of those, but there's a few thousand dollars worth of products to give away. Um, and at the very end, we'll go through our registered users. We'll also go, have a, um, go through those that are actively watching on Facebook and we'll pick some lucky people out. 
Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll do that as part of the Q and A at the end. So I think to get, to dive into this um, and to get started, um, our first speaker um, who's based out of the UK, a very um, well-known laboratory called Burns Dental Lab, a very beautiful laboratory. Again, I've already said that Ashley, but it's Ashley Burns and um, Ashley's, the, Ashley is, is known in the laboratory to um, specialize in complex aesthetic cases um, as well as dentures. And um, he's well known in the UK, he's well known globally as an international speaker. And we're really delighted to have you today to present for us, Ashley. So I'll hand over to you now and Thank yeah, you very the, much. the floor is yours. Right, let me just... Uh... Okay, all good, everyone can see that? Okay, so today I'm gonna, great. Today I'm gonna to talk a bit about sort of using your Sega really for sort of complex um, aesthetic trines. I'm gonna give a sort of breakdown of how we do it. It's a pretty simple presentation. There's not too many slides here, but it, it's been one of the sort of the, the best things that we've done uh, with our Sega. Um, so for those that don't know me, um, my name is Ashley Byrne. Um, I've got a team of 43 sort of epic people. So we're a pretty big lab uh, for the UK, uh, pretty small for the, for the US and stuff in Canada, but, but pretty big for the UK. We do high-end implant, crown and bridge denture work. Uh, and we have a very heavy focus on workflow and, and in particular additive manufacturing. You know, we mill subtractive manufacturing, but additive is, is a key part of our business. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about the importance of that and where that fits in with the, with the current industry. Now I run a very clean, modern sort of ergonomic uh, dental laboratory. And actually, I, whilst this is unpopular uh, as a phrase to some people, I do run a high tech manufacturing facility. Uh, I'm not in any way devaluing what we do as dental technicians, but I think, um, I think in, in, the, in the modern world of dental technology now, you know, high tech manufacturing is, is becoming more the norm. Um, you know, we're eliminating gypsum, we're moving away from dusty, dirty uh, things. I don't have a casting machine in my lab. Um, and for those that have been to my lab would agree that it is always immaculately clean. And that's across every single department. And I think this is, this is where labs are heading towards uh, and the ASIG has been a key part of that. Now, one of the reasons that I think we need to embrace this kind of technology is, is facts and figures like this. Now, this is the UK number of dental technicians. Um, this is happening globally. I don't know about you, I'm a 44 year old lab owner. I've got 10 vacancies at my lab and I can't fill them. Uh, no one's applying for the jobs, uh, which is a real shame. We, we work normal hours, we're a great lab to work with. Um, but the numbers are plummeting and we're now in the UK, we're now below 5,000. The estimated number we need is around uh, seven to 9,000. And we're losing 500 uh, a year in the UK, which means in 10 years, there'll be me and a few other labs and that's it. And that's quite frightening. So are we surviving or are we thriving? And I, I, this was a phrase that I, I went to a lecture in South Africa and um, we use it a lot. And I think for me, dental technology is now currently in a, in a thriving stage. I, I don't think it's uh, a survival stage. I know the number of technicians are, are dropping, but additive manufacturing and, and, and digital techniques are really allowing us to focus on the areas that we enjoy, the design, the artistry. And I think that, you know, Asiga is a key company um, that's helped us to achieve that. So we're kind of redefining the lab now, which I think is so important. Um, and, and it's a nice place to work. I mean, when I started as a lab technician, I was working silly hours. I'd come in from work covered in wax and dust and dirt, and it doesn't happen that way now. Um, I get into work at nine, I leave at 5.30. I don't, I work Monday to Thursday, I don't do Fridays. Um, my team do look after it very well. And, and that's where we are with modern dental technology now. And I think it's uh, it's suddenly become this uber cool industry to be involved in uh, and, and I love it. But that's not what we're here for today. We're here more to really talk about what I use my Asiga for and how the Asiga works. Now, fundamentally for me, the big thing for me is, is, is the problems with the full arch work. I've just realized, I think you've got the wrong screen for me. You? I think you can see both my slides. Uh, we can, that. yeah, we can. You can, yes. oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Let me just see if I can quickly change that. My apology, I've just seen it. I'm thinking I'm on the wrong screen here. I do apologize. Let me just change that over. Um, let me just 
change that over. Um, can you see that clearly now? Is that saying problems with full arch work? Yeah, that's good, Ashley. Yeah. That's good. My sincere yeah. apologies for that, guys. Thankfully, we haven't started, so we're all good. Uh, yeah, we're maybe. not recording this. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I'm better at uh, I'm better at uh, 3D printing than I am um, um, doing presentations. Um, the problem with full arch work for us is that you know we're a big high end lab and we do an awful lot of, of full arch work and. You know, the first things first to me is the verification of the cast or the iOS model. And in particular, iOS models are, are a big problem. iOS scanners are not necessarily as accurate as they should be. And, and, and that's an area that we, we struggle with sometimes. So how do we make this nice and easy? Uh, conventionally, we would do little plaster verification jigs or we do little resin verification jigs, labor intensive, slow, complicated and difficult. Not the most efficient way of doing it. How do we start with the aesthetics? Uh, you know, again, conventionally, we would, we would do a denture setup um, or we do a great big normal diagnostic wax up with wax. Incredibly time consuming. You know, if you think back to the slide of the, the reduction in numbers, you know, these are not efficient ways to be doing this. Then, of course, we've got the occlusion. There's nothing worse than, you know, I've done big full arches. We, we've verified it and the rest of it. And they go in there and then the dentist says to you, Oh, the, the left hand side, you know, it's three mil out. Just add a little bit of porcelain and, and you'll be fine. And of course, you, it's a disaster. Um, you know, how do we look at the excursions and function? How do we check this? And there's nothing worse than jumping stages and then you suddenly fit your full arch and, and then a canine fractures because all of the occlusal forces was thrown the canine. So how do we easily verify that? And again, it's difficult when you're doing the denture setup because as soon as the patient has the denture set up in the mouth, it's getting warm start to get soft. And as the patient moves around, they're knocking denture teeth off and you can't really check the excursions. Um, we don't really discuss phonetics. I, I see a lot of full arch patients that are sort of whistling as they, as they talk. Um, and again, now I, I hear people with full arches that sound like they've got a golf ball in their mouth. Um, and again, how do we test those phonetics accurately? And again, wax becomes a problem. Um, and of course, you know, how do we do the final aesthetics? You know, there's nothing worse than doing a full arch and the patient says, oh, I want slightly more rounded teeth, um, you know, and, and you've done lovely triangular square teeth or something like that. So they're big problems for me as a lab. And, and we've always been working to try and find a really reliable, cost effective solution. It's got to be cheap. You know, these, these things are, don't, you know, we, we want to keep them, um, you know, in, a, in the background, but we don't be charging a lot of money for them because they're not actually part of the treatment. So. If you fail on any of those, it's adjustments or remakes, and that's really, really expensive. Um, you know, and we're on average probably about five grand a full arch now. Um, you know, it gets costly. So this is just a very simple process of how we do it in our lab. Okay, so we've got a, an, an intraoral scan of the, the upper and the lower in occlusion. We, we always get our customers to scan uh, the palates where possible and the full lingual, so we've got a reference point between the two. And most of these, nearly ninety. I would say you know, 100% of these are, are done on ExoCAD. I'm a, I have an equal number of ExoCAD and 3Shape in my lab, but for this particular thing, I do think ExoCAD does work better. Um, and then what we do is then I, I've done my basic diagnostic wax up digitally. Um, and actually then what we do is we take some temporary cylinders, we cut those down. Um, and actually what we do is we, we re-scan them on the printed model, okay? So this is a, a printed model and we place them in there. And then what we're doing is we can scan those temporary cylinders in and then using that palette as the reference, I link the two together. I then link my diagnostic wax up that was done before and I link them to the cylinders. And now I have a very simple, relatively quick, um, you know, my team will design something like that from the original diagnostic wax up, probably half an hour to 45 minutes. Um, and now we have effectively a screw retained bridge which we're going to cement those cylinders. Of course, we want to get the customer to approve that. I'm a big fan of, of the sort of sending out the HTML files from, uh, from ExoCAD. Dead easy to look on Chrome, dead easy to look on your phone. Just make sure that the clinician is happy. And then in very simple summary, which this video here should show you, you know, we've gone from this crude kind of uh, sort of horrible um, bridge really. You know, we've, we've located in the, the, the cylinders together. And okay, then we've got our diagnostic wax up, which we link it together. You can just see that there, just a bit more visual when it's rotating. 
Um, and then we have our bridge. Nothing particularly rocket science about this. So that's the finished bridge. Okay, it's then exported as a simple STL file. Um, and of course, what we all know and love so easily, it's just simply stuck onto the plates. We use the standard supports. Um, yeah, you know, I've got two different bridges here. Unfortunately, this particular presentation is going to jump between the two because there were live jobs and I missed a couple of photos, so I've switched it between. But I've also showed these two here because we do them with pink and without pink. Um, you know, and you can see there we've got one here with six, and we've got one here. I think with, I think six cylinders on the other one as well. Um, you know, one of the big things I, I run multiple three D printers in my my lab, but I think the biggest um, attraction to me with the Asiga is just the openness of all the materials. I use the free print uh, material from DTAX for these. Uh, pretty strong. Uh, we don't tend to get fractures or failures. I, I like it because it's relatively um, rigid. There's, there's not too much flex. Remember, we're using these to verify the cast. So I don't want to talk these down and find they flex all over the place. Um, we stick them on the plates. We print them. I only have a, a little max. Uh, just works fantastically well for me. 43 minutes. You know, speedy, it's fast. I love that. Uh, and then comes out and it cleans it. Um, we actually clean ours now with a, with a non-IPA solution. Uh, I meant to take a picture of that today and I forgot, but we use a, a Vortex machine with, with a non-IPA uh, company called Post Process. Um, we put those in there, we clean them, uh, cure them. And uh, now I have my 3D printed model with the temporary cylinders in that I showed you before. It's nothing particularly rocket science about this. And then you can see that, you know, that's the 3D printed uh, model, uh, the 3D printed uh, Stratus Seeger. I break the supports off and I just roughly go over it with a burr nice and simply. To loot these then, I, I used to loot them with a, a cement. Uh, I find that too, it's too time consuming. And also I found a couple of times where I've gone to use the cement and when I turn it over to screw it down, one falls out or you're not quick enough and the cement has started to set. So we just use a bit of resin there, okay, nothing complicated. So I just take a little Lacron, I run some around the temporary cylinder and I run some inside the bridge. I drop the cylinders uh, in one by one, that's uncured at this stage. So I can still put those cylinders out, you can see the liquid is still wet on that slide. And then very, very simply, I just screw it to the model. Then I know it's 100% passive, okay, I know there's no thing. I, I used to be very careful about trimming inside these, the Seeger prints so accurately now for me, I don't do that. I'll just push the cylinder straight in. I'll stick them in after flash, cure them. Um, and then these come out and this is cured. And, and what I'm trying to show here also is that we want to keep this just off the soft tissue. This is a verification jig. So it's not 100% aesthetics at this stage, but what we want to do is make sure as this screws down, we do the Sheffield test. So I get my clinicians to screw down the left-hand side Take, a, take an x-ray, always use metal cylinders, don't use peak or plastic because they won't pick up. Try the other side, check that's all passive. If that's all passive, then we're happy. If not, they can section these and then we re redo them. But if they are all fine, then the patient can actually put them in, check, you know, bite, check all the occlusion, check all those areas, um, and it's good. And <sighs> this is it, I mean, it's just so simple. So, you know, by using this, we can actually now verify the cast. Okay, it's a nice, accurate, simple way to do it. By using that Sheffield test and using metal temporary cylinders, it's good. If we really want to keep the cost down on here, a few of my dentists return these to us. We, we take the cylinders out and then we put them through the autoclave ready for the next um, case. Most of our customers don't bother with that. They, they tend to keep these. You have your aesthetics as a start. This is tried in. This is hard. This is resin. You know, the patients can lick it. They can smile. There is a one millimeter gap, but it's only one millimeter gap. And the dentist tells the patients that, of course, we can check our occlusion. If the occlusion is not right at this stage, the clinician will grind that in, take a new silicone bite, <coughs> so excuse me, and then we can link those together uh, back into the CAD system and we, we, we know we've got a good accurate occlusion. We check all the excursions, of course, the patient can, wear the, can check the phonetics. And, you know, if we want to, do this slightly better, we can actually add a little bit of wax to these or, or a little bit of resin to, to close it to the soft tissue and we can actually do a retry as a final aesthetic uh, finishing. What I particularly like about these is that actually some of our clinicians send our patients away for 24 hours. Now they're not particularly aesthetic and the patients are warned in that way, but we're finding the detox is pretty strong. We've had some of these in the mouth now for, you know, sort of a month with no fractures or failures. 
I, I wouldn't trust it personally. I'd probably more likely a long term I'd mill PMMA. Um, but for a quick and speedy temp, these are flipping amazing, and I, I'm really enjoying the materials we're using. Um, we've also, you know, this is a case I showed you before. This particular condition here, uh, we've got a similar setup here. You know, we've got same um, tooth with the resins. But what's different about this particular one is that the condition, this particular person does both a stone cast impression as well as, a, as, a, as an iOS. And this is great. So before I send this out, I can just quickly transfer between the two. Now, this, these two transfer beautifully. I think this is a video. Uh, yeah, we transfer between the two here. That's just hand held down. You know, that's great. When we know that the iOS works as well as we know that the, that the, um, that the stone can cast. So I've actually already verified the cast before we even sent it out. Um, now, most of my customers don't go to this level of accuracy, um, but I do find these jigs do work quite well. Um, I made this one a little bit thinner because we've got the two casts. If you are doing this as a singular verification jig, I would usually thicken it up in the pallet. Sometimes at QC, I might not be too happy about the thickness of it. And actually, I just run some resin and I just cure it uh, quickly and easily. Um, but they do work incredibly well. As I said, these, these are, you know, these can be standing glazed. We tend to use optiglaze with them, um, you know, and we have some customers that pay a little bit more for these and they want a much sort of higher quality uh, try-in. Um, and then we will optiglaze them and we get the occasional person that's happy to pay for it. And we just put a bit of pink composite on. Um, I apologize about the poor quality picture. One of my team, Christian, did this and pinged it to me whilst I was away in a conference and I just found it on my phone. Um, but, you know, that is printed. Um, you know, printed detached material with just some pink flowable on there and a little bit of optiglaze. Uh, and actually the patient wore this, I think for about two weeks, checked the patient was 100% happy with it. And then we turned that into a, into a bonded uh, bridge. So, you know, it works well. And, you know, this is kind of what we do. I mean, this is just some very crude slides that I just chucked in at the end of this, in this little short presentation. So we've scanned in, so we've imported the original file there of our verification, this, this, this aesthetic try-in effectively. Um, I've used that then to design the subframe. This was designed on ExoCAD and it was sent to, to Createch Medical in Spain. Uh, we've designed that. Then of course, I know the aesthetics are gonna be good. So we've used that as the masking point to, to then set the teeth up, you know, and, and that's the final bridge. Okay, and this was finished by Christian and Vlad. Vlad did all the finishing, Christian did the subframe. Um, you know, and these kind of complex bridges become relatively easy. I mean, you can't put all that time and effort into a bridge like that, and then it come back and you find the inclusions wrong. And since you implemented this particular method of doing these 3D printed sort of verification jig of aesthetic try-ins, my remake and adjustment rate has hit near zero. And I mean, literally near zero. I think we've had one bridge we had to adjust recently because the soft tissue had shrunk back over a period of time because of COVID. I can't remember having a full arch back for an adjustment uh, now, probably for the last sort of two years, two to three years since we started uh, using the Asiga. So, you know, a very brief summary really is that from our dentist perspective, they love this concept. It's far better than using, you know, sort of white blocks or denture try-ins. Uh, so it definitely reduces appointments. We're managing to do an aesthetic try at the same time as we're doing an aesthetic try. So we do, sorry, we're doing an aesthetic try verification, bite registration, everything in one go. And, and the clinicians just love that. It also makes the patient feel a bit more connected to the, to the treatment, and that's key. Um, it definitely improves the reliability of the treatment, as I explained, gives that assurance to the patient. As I said, it vastly reduces the risk, of, the, the risk of, of adjustments and repairs. But one of the things we also encourage our customers to do now is to keep these, okay? Don't recycle the cylinders for what they cost. Put them in the box. If there is a fracture or a failure, that is an emergency spare. Yes, it is all white in color, but white in color is better than having the front four teeth missing because someone's fallen over um, or whatever. Uh, the pink can be added very manually, quickly and easily. Sometimes we actually just paint the pink on with a bit of OptiGlaze just to give that little differences. It just makes complex work very, very easy. And I'll leave you with this last slide here that if you don't own an Asiga, um, I want you to consider this that a full arch in my lab is around 5,000 pounds, okay? So if you have two remakes, okay, if two remakes have been saved by using that printer, your printer is effectively free. Um, so just think about it in that, if you don't own an Asiga, I strongly suggest you buy one. 
Um, and I'm not paid to say that. I'm just doing this as a, as a, as a favor to a seeger. So that's me. Thank you for listening. And uh, if you want any information, contact me through, through Burns Dental. Uh, and um, I hope that was of some use to you guys. That was great. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah, there's some questions that have come in for you. I think we'll cover them. We'll cover them shortly towards the end. But that was a, yeah, that was a great. That was a nice, um, nice comments at the end. And I think there's a, there's some truth in that. Whether it's an Asiga system or another system, you know, there's the the benefits that can be achieved from 3D printing. You know, can offer your business some efficiencies and also some cost savings. Um, so thank you again, Ashley. Um, we'll we'll, we'll um, move on to our next speaker. Um, so our next speaker is um, st streaming or coming to us from Iceland. Um, his name is uh, Marcus Mensinski, um, and he's based at. And you'll have to you'll have to excuse my um, pronunciation here, Marcus. But I've got Tansmidjen Krona, um, a dental lab in Iceland. Um, and Marcus again, he's he, they the lab there specialises in um, complex aesthetic cases, and Marcus is going to present all on six immediate loading. So Marcus, over to you. Hello, hi there. So yeah, my topic will be the immediate loading and how I do in the do the design in Exocat. Let's see. Um, no, I can't make it bigger. Oh no. So yeah, immediate loading. But first of all, I would like to thank Matthias for creating the group, the Sega Experts Group, and yeah, it's a nice place to be. So what is immediate loading? Immediate loading is nothing else than just a teeth in one day. The patient um, comes in, some scans are taken, and um, the implants are placed. And then he walks out with an immediate loading full arch bridge, for example. So this is actually how we start each case. We get the first scan from the dentist, like here, upper jaw and the lower jaw. But it's not much to start with, so we need some additional data and scans. So the dentist is providing us with another scan, the upper denture and the lower partial denture in, in the correct bite. But still, we don't have enough time and not enough data to be able to, to put them all together. It's just all hollow inside, so it's, there are no reference points for us. So then I ask for another scan with the denture and the, and the jaw scan as well, like here. So we have enough landmarks to be able to, to put them together in Exocat. So now we got everything and let's start. Uh, it's just a quick first setup in Exocat. I just use Pontex and I review first all scan data in Exocat, if I can merge it or not. So just like this. I do some first testing and uh, matching just to be sure when I actually start a real case, the design of it, I can really merge everything and match together. This is easily done in Exocat. So the lower. So it's all fine, it's perfect. I also load the upper jaw in C2 and also with the lower jaw and the correct bite. So this matches up nicely. So this is the denture and the jaw scan below it. So Yeah, and after that, we start designing. I'm going to design on this data just a wax up, similar to Ashley, like he does it. So I merge the toothless jaw, the upper jaw, with the CETO scan, with all this palatinal area here, and using all kinds of landmarks to be able to merge them together. And this this is um, this is working almost each time for our for our work. So we get good scans, enough reference points to be able to merge everything together. And then we just we don't merge the scans. We replace the whole upper jaw with the denture on top of it. 
with just a toothless jaw. We can add all kinds of, of scans to it and all kinds of data. So here I'm adding the pre-up scan also to the jaw. And this is how it's done in Exocat. We have enough points here to, to be able to match it all together. And the pre-up denture will help us or help me to, to design the teeth later, to put it, the, the denture, uh, the, the pontex. So everything looks fine. And then we can block out now or maybe later, this doesn't matter. We can do everything in expert mode. So now we do the Pontex placement. Why not in gold? So it's just very easy and quickly done. And the pre up denture will be, we can use it to be able to place them closer to the denture. So it will help us. Also, for this full arch cases, and also on immediate loading, I do also I use the virtual articulator. It's a little bit rough. Also, this is done because I didn't take on the actual case any screenshots, so I redesigned it just quickly to have something for the presentation. I will show you later the, the design, how I did it. Then we block out the jaw, and you're ready for the next step to draw the Gingiver outlines. There we have it. It's almost, it's almost done. It's just really quick and easy to do. Then we can freeform this area, make it a little bit nicer, better looking, like this. And then we have a lot of free freeform options. We can freeform the teeth and we can adjust the bite more if we need to. So the wax up is done. And this is something I just save and keep for when the implants uh, are placed. So nothing else, it's just a wax up. It's just, we have the teeth and the base and it's all we need for, for the next steps. Here's a short video, some few days later, maybe weeks later, the patient is getting the implant placed. This was done with surgery, uh, guided surgery. So most of the Icelandic dentists using uh, the intraoral scanners, Trios, Itero, uh, Medit, Sirona, so. So and now, later the day I will get this sent to us. Oops. Yeah, this is how it looks like. And again, we have here enough landmarks to be able to to merge them together to the previous jaw scan. So, so now I import just in the in the in the previous design. I just import, change the order in in the dental DB a little bit. Uh, choose which which are going to be screwed, which are some Pontix. Merge these scans together. It's it's a fairly good enough alignment. Everything is aligned perfectly here for to be able to to work with it. Merging the scanning abutments. And this is done on multi units, so the implants are placed, and we have uh, multi units in between. And then titanium bases, which are non-hexed. So this is really simple, simple procedure. But uh, not every scan marker is scanned really nicely. As you can hear, we have some distortion here on this scan, scan marker, and also on this one. So having this on not directly screwed to the multi-units gives us the possibility, or at the dentist's office, to grind out a little bit more of the, of the acrylic and glue them to have a passive fit. So matching and stitching. This one is much, much better as you can see here. So this step is done. Now we have all the titanium bases up here. And the next step is very easy. I just load my previous design, the wax up and put it on, on the jaw scan. Here we see the scanning abutments and my design. Basel view, all the analogs are also here, which is important for later for the model design. We can play with the button buttons if you want to, but normally I just leave them like how they are. So when the wax up is now a bridge which we can mill out or print out. So it's an immediate loaded uh, full arch design, less in 
five minutes. If the previous uh, setup was done nicely and also the preparation were done. It's also very important to, to keep when we're designing this, to keep these areas around the implants uh, for cleaning. Patients normally wear this here in like for three or four months before he gets the final um, restoration. So once again, here are the steps in Exocat. First, I just use Pontix. Then I change the order to some Pontix and some screw retained uh, crowns. So yeah, so this is the, the case I'm going to show you. This was my design, my, my wax up, how I would like to see it. It's close to the denture setup. Here in the bite. So here the basal view again, no screws, nothing inside here yet. Then we merge everything in ExoCAD, make the screw or chest holes. And this is just looks really, really nice, I think. So yeah, teeth in the same day. So the patient comes in in the morning, the implants are placed. And then later that day, he walks out with a nice uh, new smile. I designed the models also. They are printed on the Asica Max UV, and I use a dental dental model from Asica, which is really really nice material. Another view. Now we can start milling and printing, and this needs to be delivered the same day. The surgery is done flapless, so we don't get any swelling for the king giver, or we need to deliver this the same day. This is the idea behind immediate loading. Here's just another view. Easy, simple, space here for cleaning. Everything is done at our lab at the, at the Asikas. Now the model printing, everything is printed flat. I like to print flat. I don't like supports, not the models. And just in case if something should go wrong with the milling, I can also or do sometimes print a temporary this temporary bridge in GC temp. But for three or four, six months, I would rather like to have it in PMMA. It's just, uh, I sleep better. So this is the, um, the milling side. Uh, we use uh, Millbox and Roland milling machines, also IMS, but IMS was out of order. So sometimes this happens also, some hardware problems. So the Roland was good enough to mill this out. It's, it's, they are great machines. This is the nesting. Uh, we can make this um, basis, uh, the space here for the titanium basis a little bit wider if we need to, depending on the milling burst and the setup would you have in your lab. I take a look at the, at the simulation also to be sure everything turns out nicely. At the same time, when I'm doing this work, when I do the nesting, I also start to print or paint the models. This takes about two hours, uh, two and a half hours milling. And this is how it's, when it's milled out, I place the bases, some blast them first, glue them inside and polish everything in a nice high shine polish, which is very important that these basal areas here are, which come in contact with the soft tissue are really high, high shine polish, so no dirt and nothing can stick to it. And the patient can clean here also easily in between. We do, a, we do a lot of these uh, jobs. So here you can see a little bit of cement. And what's going on? Yeah, no. So it's also fine and bite. I use the virtual articulator, so I just trust it, uh, how it comes out here. Also the dentist has the possibility to adjust the bite if necessary. And this is just uh, the milled out in, in A2, I believe, in, PMA. And this scan was just sent uh, in the middle of February. The patient is very happy with it. He doesn't want to change anything. And the next step would be to mill it out in Zirconia. Uh, I myself, I would like to shorten this one, maybe shorten the, the canine here. Just I have to go through it a little bit. And this is how the patients looked at the, at the same day after the surgery. I think it's quite nice. The middle line could be a little bit to the left, but this is something we can fix uh, when we redesign it. 
And the next step will be the zirconia. And hopefully this turns out also great as this case in the picture. So yeah, this is this is everything from my side. Thank you for your for your for listening and your attention. I will be here to answer some questions. So yeah. Graham, back to you. Thank you very much, Marcus. That was that was great. Thanks for covering that case. There are some questions that have come in for you, so we'll cover them um, shortly at the end of the, okay. the, the last speaker. Um, so thanks again for that. Our next um, speaker that's um, that we've got for you is from Canada. She's very well known. She's a very well known denturist um, in Canada, and she's come to present. 3D printed dentures, which is a it's a pretty hot topic right now um, across well globally, it's a hot topic in 3D printing. Um, so Tanya, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, it's kind of hard to follow Ashley and Marcus on that. Uh, my my discussion today will be on full dentures and all the things that uh, we use our printers for in our denture workflow. Hopefully you can see my screen okay, and uh, my sound is all right. So I wanted to have a quick discussion on my amazing group of coworkers. Uh, I'm really fortunate to have a team to support me uh, get through my knowledge and adventures of digital dentures. I have three clinicians, a technician and two front end staff. In addition, I posted this the other day, uh, I have two more coworkers that are very valuable. We have Ursula and Felicia, and they are uh, really valued members of our office. And when we are working, they are working. And when we are not working, they are working. So I really want to just express the necessity to have printers uh, assisting you with your lab work, specifically your denture lab work. And I'm just going to talk quickly because I only have 20 minutes to talk about what we're using in our office and what's what's good and what's not. The overview of my 20 minutes today will be trays and nathometers, monoblocks, the functional try-ins, uh, brief discussion on copy dentures, uh, drop-in denture teeth, that workflow, Media dentures, which is something I love to do in the office. Uh, my colleagues are happy that I like to do uh, digital immediate dentures. They're very rewarding. And I will discuss with you the benefits of that. Also finishing, that was really challenging for us uh, is to figure out how to properly finish a printed denture so that the patient can have it in their, their mouth for many weeks and many months sometimes. And then of course, why a SIGA? Now, I, of course, am from Canada. I'm in the beautiful province of British Columbia, which is the westernmost province of Canada. And um, the materials that I have to use in my office are going to be different than what you have to use in your office. And of course, I want you to know that the prices and things that I'm indicating here, the nitty gritty, uh, are based on the materials that I can get from my resellers. So the print times and costs will definitely vary for you depending on your materials and your nesting strategies. Printed trays and base plates create ideal patient comfort. This is something that you will start to do probably right away when you get your scanners and your printers. Um, they take a matter of minutes. They do provide incredible impressions. It's a uniform thickness that you just can't get by hand. And I know I'm gonna probably get slaughtered for saying this, but uh, printed trays are better than handcrafted trays. And uh, I've, I've convinced some of my coworkers who were sort of anti-digital in the beginning, but you know, once you start using them in the mouth, um, it's just the uniform thickness just applies better distribution of the materials. And then of course, if you can have better detail, you're going to have a better fit. The nitty gritty of base plates, here we are. Um, you can see that the time to print maybe give or take 75 minutes, depending on your nesting strategies. You can see here that we use the, the photo dent tray uh, material. Um, we've, we found that it works quite well for us. Uh, and then, you know, the cost again, varying two to $3, depending on if it's a base plate uh, or a tray. So you can see here, this was done on, um, 
Ursula, our little uh, Max, and uh, she's just a little workhorse. You can, you can get a lot of work done on these guys while you're doing other things, which is a key message here today. This is the, the nathometers. Um, this, this can happen from an intraoral scan uh, to produce these, or you can scan your impressions. And it's a preliminary sanctuary tray with an upper and a lower impression, all done in one to produce these print plates that these nathometers, you can put your pin tracer on to establish your final centric relation and final impressions. You can either scan those and go straight to uh, try in, or you can, if you wanna pour them up, you've got lots of options. You can mix the analog and printed workflow. So this is something that uh, I wanted to talk about you know, this is going to, oops, sorry. This is going to take up probably a lot of my time. Ah, is uh, the monoblock uh, or the functional try-ins. And I know that um, Ashley echoed this with the, the fixed cases. This is something that we use in our office um, every day. And um, they are really ideal if you have a patient come in with a, a decent denture. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but I wanted to show you here that the print time on these, you know, give or take again, three hours, depending on the size of the arch uh, and or your nesting strategies. Um, you can see that we like to print them with the impression or intaglio surface with the supports because uh, we will a lot of times take impressions inside of these. So there's, there's different options for you to consider. So again, these are most ideal when the patient presents with a satisfactory denture. And, and you know, what is satisfactory? You know, decent plane of occlusion, uh, decent vertical, uh, not, not too many things to change. Um, you can utilize this to create a printed try-in for the patient to verify, you know, changes to the arrangement, the display, uh, the center line, the phonetics, these patients can take them home. They can wear them. They can eat with them. Um, you can use these as therapeutic dentures if you're going to be opening up the bite, three, four, five millimeters. Um, sometimes you can add uh, pink resin to the facial area if desired for just peace of mind for the patient. You can convert this to um, a drop-in finish denture. Uh, so you can, you can mill the arch of teeth, you can mill the whole thing. You have lots of options, but the printed monoblock or functional try is really a uh, key to success for the patient and their confidence getting used to a new denture and accepting the changes that you're indicating. Hopefully that makes sense. So the immediate dentures or copy dentures, um, there's some options here as well. Uh, we print, I would say, almost all of our immediate dentures. Um, we Most of them are done through an intraoral scan. Uh, we do, I'm not sure if you can see this, just keep there with me here. This is, uh, you can, if it's not an intraoral scan, you can scan your models and the articulator, everything can be done, still designing it digitally. So if you don't have an intraoral scanner, you can still produce printed immediate dentures. Uh, and then obviously the mouth is going to change. It's going to be different for every patient. Sometimes you can just do a chair side reline on a printed denture base. And we like to use the Tokuyama chair side reline material. Uh, it works really well. It bonds well, uh, polishes well. Uh, and or you can take an impression and then rescan, redesign, or reprint. Uh, another benefit to the printed dentures uh, is the copy denture. So you can you can even finish an analog case and scan that and have that as a record, or you can reprint a uh, printed denture with the impression in it with a new fit. You know, hopefully you've already adjusted the bite and they've acquired to that, and it's just a matter of printing a new one with with the new impression material. We do print, uh, we probably print them two to three times during the patient's healing, if there's six or more teeth coming out, um, just for patient comfort, to keep it nice and thin and we'll modify the bite. Lots of times on our immediates, we will drop the sevens or just drop a premolar, um, just to, to make it feel smaller for them initially. You can imagine what it would be like to have, you know, 20 teeth out all at once, it's a big deal. Uh, so this is a printed denture, 
workflow with the drop-in teeth. And again, we've used these a lot as well. It's a really great solution. Uh, this is going to be peace of mind for technicians or clinicians that sort of want that hybrid approach of, you know, the real tooth. It's a printed base. You can um, adjust the teeth if needed, if you needed to um, maybe correct the display or the arrangement. You would have to articulate that case. So it's a bit of a drawback. So you really want to make sure you're spending the proper amount of time um, getting all of the information you need while you're in the chair with the patient to produce the best results. Now, I find on these cases, you need to really monitor the um, inner occlusal space because you want to make sure that you have room for the, the neck of the teeth to sit into the pocket and you're just going to put a little bit of wax in there. So these, these cases turn out really well. And again, um, what we would do on these ones is we would take our impression inside the printed base and then we would flask and I will base the whole case and leaving the teeth in there, pulling out the printed base and then injecting for final finish. So hopefully that makes sense. So the nitty gritty on printed dentures, um, 10 to $15 per denture, you know, depending on the materials that you're selecting. Uh, we use the Drev uh, photo dent. We really like the transparent right now, the, the denture resin and the Denka denture teeth is what we're using in our office. So you can see the breakdown here on the print time as well as uh, the cost per, per denture. And uh, we're gonna talk about the finishing of them in a few more slides here. So this is an immediate printed denture that that we finished recently. Um, he's still wearing it. Uh, he's waiting for his implants to integrate. Um, we've had good success with this one. Uh, it turned out really quite nice and natural. On the Denka denture teeth, I believe there's about six different shades um, for us to select for patients. So we just have a little note in the treatment room when we're doing our consultations and we just you know, tell the patient that we're going to shade match the best we can. And then, of course, when we convert them into their final denture, whether it be milled or just a full analog workflow, we can really refine the um, shade selection for them at that point. And again, if you don't have an intraoral scanner, you can definitely uh, mount your case as you would normally and uh, scan it and design it, print it. This was something we've done recently as well for, for a patient. We needed a temporary solution for her. Um, she was into a full immediate upper denture and she was getting her lower posterior teeth extracted. So I did connect with a, co a colleague about this and we sort of come up with a thought of using the clear uh, keystone splint soft material for the base. And then this is the, these are the Denka denture teeth that's uh, just bonded together and cured as we would normally, and she's still wearing it. Um, it does just have enough a bit of give there for her for the comfort. And I, I did actually print a, a Dentka base, uh, sorry, um, a printed denture base on this and I tried it, but it, it broke. So I'm still working on that. This is something that I'm really happy about is the uniform thickness. Uh, patients love it, you can get them you know, 1.5 millimeter uniform thickness all across the palate. And I show them this in the consultation so that they're not worried about a thick, bulky denture in their mouth. And again, I'm, I'm just a big fan of printed dentures. You can see here on that photo of that mandibular uh, base plate there that it's just super thin and the patient comfort is number one. So finishing. This is the post-processing and finishing of these 3D printed denture materials. We did struggle with this in the beginning, and I did have, you know, over the last couple of years, very good conversations with colleagues about solutions for this. Um, we did try to do just a, a light pumice and high shine like you would with a traditional PMMA material, um, but we, I just feel like it was really saturating and staining quite, quite hard. Uh, so then we started to jump to the GC Optiglaze, which you can see it's only five mil here. So when you start to coat your denture with this onto here and you do denture after denture, it's not very cost effective. 
So a colleague on here actually on the Facebook uh, page connected with me about a solution to use the same resin that you're using to produce your denture with. And so in this case, we would use the Denka denture resin and we would just have a little brush and feather it over the, the occlusal surfaces of the teeth, the buccofacial, and then we would use the gingival resin to do the base and then we would cure it. And I tell you, there's no turning back on this. Uh, if you're not finishing your printed dentures this way, it is a game changer. So why choose a SEGA? Um, I'm going to echo the same conversations we've had earlier is reliability, I think is the number one that keeps coming up. Uh, of course, the accuracy is there, um, the speed, uh, the nesting software, the composer is quite easy to use. And obviously for everyone on, on this platform watching this webinar, the, the sources of materials available, open materials. I mean, this is old information. I'm sure there's more now. Um, but one thing that I really want to stress to you is to make sure you're choosing your reseller wisely. Uh, you need to have proper support for your 3D printers. I'm lucky enough to work with Dental Access and Swiss Enough, uh, and obviously have all of these colleagues here on Facebook to, to help when there's running into issues. So I put this little draft there because uh, in the, when I first got into 3D printing, I, I felt like I had my head in the clouds and uh, it's blue skies out here in British Columbia. So hopefully you guys can start uh, your journey with uh, printing dentures and a SIGA. And you can please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to connect with you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Tanya. That was, that was really um, good and informative. I'm, I'm happy to see that, you know, Ashley has got pet goats and you've got a pet giraffe. So <laughs> I don't know who's going to trump each other there. But, but it's a very good point you make about choosing the right support crew or the, the reseller, you know, to because I'm sure lots are going into 3D printing and or just technology in general, it can be. Can, can be a bit overwhelming. So uh, working with a company that can support you through that's important. But thanks yeah. again, thanks again, Tanya. That was that was awesome. Um, so I'll now introduce our next speaker, our final speaker for this webinar series today before we go into a QA and a um, round table at the end. Our speaker is Min Tram uh, from Den Dental Tech Tips in Canada. Min doesn't need much introduction because if, if you are on social media and following posts from the upcoming show in Chicago, LMT Lab Day, then I'm sure you'll know about Min, because I think Min is, he's, he's, he's well known in the, in the um, digital dental um, sphere, and he's, he's been known to talk for many companies. So um, Din, uh, Min, it's a, it's a joy to have you with us today, and I'll hand over the stage to you. Welcome. Well, thank you, Graham. Uh, it's a very nice way of saying I spend too much time on social media and Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, guys, uh, what's up? It's Min here from Dental Tech Tips. Today, we're going to be speaking about splints and night guards as an efficient and profitable direct print application. So before I begin, I do want to say thank you again to Graham, Corey, the whole team at ASEGA uh, for organizing this wonderful event and reaching out to me to speak today. ASEGA's uh, such a wonderful company uh, with great products, award-winning products that, and it's been amazing to see, both see and participate in the incredible growth that they've experienced in the dental industry. And of course, I wanna say thank you to the Asiga Dental Experts Group, uh, the whole mod team, the admin team, Matthias, uh, everybody, uh, the mod team that I'm privileged to be a part of. And of course, all the active users in the group as well, who make it one of the best dental related Facebook groups that I'm a part of. Uh, we have over 8,500 uh, members on there, and it's such a wonderful community of people who are always willing to share, collaborate, and just help each other out in any way that we can. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, if you don't know who I am, my name is Min Tran. I'm a second-generation dental technician based out of Windsor, Ontario. Uh, I've been in the in industry since 2006, and I've spent most of that time behind a computer using a mouse and keyboard primarily with three shape, but I've been fortunate enough to use a wide variety of digital technology, uh, ranging from milling, uh, zirconia, and of course, additive manufacturing technologies like printing. Um, in my spare time, of course, I run a blog called Dental Tech Tips, where we focus on the latest and greatest in dental technology. So if you'd like to connect with me online or via social media, you can find me in all the usual places by searching at Dental Tech Tips. 
So for the next little bit, uh, we're going to give you a very quick look into 3D printed splints or night guards as they're called. And a lot of you may already be printing night guards uh, with your Sega printers, or you may be offering splints in a traditional, uh, traditionally fabricated manner, and you're considering switching those workflows over to a digital one. And oftentimes what we print with our 3D printers uh, are models, templates, prototypes, and a whole wide range of parts and things that are ultimately disposable. So due to the inherent nature of 3D printed resins as they are today with the, with the engineering capabilities of the technology, a lot of things we print uh, don't serve as final uh, end user products, right? They serve as intermediaries for that final product. So you print a model so you can make a crown on it or you, you make an aligner on it. So a lot of these parts are, are not profitable. Ultimately, you just end up throwing them in the garbage, but they are necessary for subsequent steps. Direct print applications, however, can be highly profitable and be a source of revenue for your printers to produce and at scale rather than just being something that's sitting there being a cost, right? So 3D printed splints are one of the most popular direct print applications today that we use in our lab and probably all around the world. And the way that splints take advantage of the unique scalability and technologies found in 3D printing makes them highly efficient compared to many other uh, processes. Splint therapy, of course, and, and splints are used to treat and prevent a number of disorders ranging from excessive wear of anatomy, TMJ, uh, issues like sleep apnea, or even a mobilization of periodontally involved or compromised teeth. So it, it's an, they're an excellent non-invasive form of therapy that you can use to provide immediate relief for, for your patients. So the terminology sometimes can be a little bit confusing as well. You can hear they can be called night guards, occlusal guards, splints. So you don't really need to rely on the word itself or the terminology, but what you really need to look at is the script, what the doctor is trying to treat when looking at, when, try, when working with these and making sure that you're fabricating the proper device. So um, the, the name splint is very interchangeable and, and, and kind of vague. Uh, a very popular use for splints uh, that I find in our lab is actually recommending post-restorative post splints. So a patient who's had a full mouth re rehabilitation, a lot like the cases that Ashley and Marcus were showing earlier, they've demonstrated excessive wear. They, they've got a lot of edentulous uh, or fully edentulous and they're being replaced with implants. So this post-restorative night guard or splint is, is something that we typically recommend to protect their investment, right? So we're altering VDO, patients have you know, compromised occlusion and they've destroyed their natural dentition. If they can do a number on that, what you know, they, they've been given naturally, I'm sure they can wear down and destroy what we've managed to make in the lab, no matter how robust we've managed to make them. So it's simply just a no brainer to provide a post restorative splint as, as a form of protection. So again, they're, they're going through surgeries, grafting, uh, a whole bunch of prosthetic work. It's, it's a pretty, it, it could be in the tens of thousands of dollars by the time they're finished. And of course, the same goes for cosmetic cases, right? If they've got 10, 12, 16 veneers, if you're doing upper and lower, uh, these super thin veneers, usually they finish right at the incisal edge. A splint is almost an, an automatic no-brainer in that situation for, for every case that we do for those cosmetics. And again, depending on your business policies, um, in our lab, we offer warranties uh, at no additional co cost, but maybe you want to offer an extended warranty, or maybe you want to do it as a value-added warranty item, where if they, don't per well, if they don't get this splint, it doesn't cover like a, a longer-term warranty, right? So it is, it is something that you can use to augment kind of your business model to, to protect these restorations. And approximately at nearly 30% of all dental patients that come through a dental clinic are probably a good candidate for splints or splint therapy. Uh, I estimate that lab work, things that are coming through the lab, are, that figure is much higher because they're already showing some form of compromised occlusion in one way or another. So if that patient's already experiencing you know, some, some form of compromised occlusion, very much like that warranty item I was telling you guys before about in the previous slide, what I'll do is we'll look at it, if, even if everything looks relatively healthy, as health professionals, we're kind of obligated to provide the patient with the best form of treatment possible. So if you look at the models and you're looking at it and you say, you know what, I think this patient would benefit from a splint, right? Just from a visual analysis of their models, maybe leave a note in the case when it, 
when it comes time to delivery or just pick up the phone, call up the dentist and say, hey, you know what, I think we should also do a splint for this. And nine times out of 10, they'll agree. So it, it's a great way to build relationships with your clients. It's a great way to, you know, provide a better service to the patients. And ultimately, you know, you do get a boost to your bottom line, but that's more of a positive side effect rather than an ultimate goal. Uh, what we really started pushing, especially with the onset of the pandemic and everything like that, was we, we made it not not a point to push, but but kind of just an initiative to keep it in the back of our minds for all of our technicians. If you see something on a case where, you know, maybe they'll benefit from a splint, just include a note in there. And actually, it has shown a, a little bit of a, a growth revenue uh, center during the pandemic. So it, it's been a very nice bonus there. So going Back to my point of like a, a case where we did for this one here, I think we did 10 veneers on this one. It was a crown lengthening case. So we have all these veneers that they finish right at the incisal edge. And uh, I didn't capture a picture of it, but I mean, the last thing we did was the, the doctor scanned these the day of delivery. We designed a splint for, for this patient here and then she put it in and it was a key splint soft material, which is very nice. Well, we'll go into more about the details a little bit later. Uh, about the actual characteristics of the material, but it's very nice just to see, you know, like they've invested so much, it's very life-changing, right? So something as simple as a, a, a splint to kind of protect that long-term is, is a very, just a no-brainer. So the types of splints that you can typically use are broadly classified into two types, of course. You have hard and soft splints. Uh, typically hard splints are undesirable due to their rigidity and the lack of patient comfort. A lot of people shy away from prescribing these because you get this characteristic like tightness, itchiness, and it's just very uncomfortable bordering on almost painful. Uh, these splints don't have any give at all, right? Uh, but the benefit of course, is these materials are very, very strong. They're resistant to abrasion, uh, they're highly durable, and they have a much wider range of indications as a technician, I'm not uh, qualified to rec like to comment on the clinical aspects, but I've learned over the years that you know that with hard splints and what you find in the literature is that um, you have a reduction of the masticatory muscles uh, when recommending a hard splint, right? So patients who have who suffer from severe bruxism, they'll be prescribed a uh, a hard splint. Soft splints, on the other hand, are, are much more comfortable for patients. And this is easily probably 90% of the splints that we do in, in the lab nowadays uh, in a 3D printed manner. Uh, but typically, you know, they lack the robustness of the, the harder counterparts. And traditionally, they'd also have to be fabricated much, much, much thinner, uh, much thicker, uh, because they just to hold up and be more durable. Now with printing and the engineering materials that they've you can make them relatively thin and it's super, super comfortable, comfortable for the patient. And these materials, they, they uh, implement what's like a thermoplastic quality. So when they're heated, when they get up to body temperature, the material kind of molds and softens and it has this memory effect. So it, it returns to a shape that it, it, it's uh, originally designed for. You also have dual laminates. So this is like a hard soft hybrid where you have like a hard cameo surface and a soft intaglio. Uh, these are typically uh, vacuum formed using two sheets of material, but th th there are uses because it's kind of like a best of both worlds. Now let's switch gears a little bit. We're going to kind of dive in a little bit deeper and speak about occlusion and centric relation a little bit. And why I think it's really important is we, kind of, we really overlook this because bruxism is kind of like a, a wide net that we cast um, in this industry. You know, uh, if you see excessive wear or anything like that, a lot of people are, are very eager to classify it as bruxism and then recommend a splint to, to try and mitigate that wear. But bruxism itself is, is a, a dysfunction of the TMJ, right? So it can be de defined as excessive wear uh, either in the centric or eccentric positions. So what we need to realize is that eccentric, your centric position is when your mandibles are fully seated in their most retruded position in the condyles. Uh, this is different from a uh, centric occlusion or also called maximum intercuspa intercuspation, where when you bite down, you have bilaterally balanced contact with your teeth. These two don't necessarily correspond. Ideally they do, but over time with age, with um, you know, compromises in occlusion, they do deviate from each other. And typically what happens is uh, we, as lab technicians, we receive blue moose bites, bite registrations, scans, and these registrations or these records only communicate um, 
set, uh, maximum intercuspation records. They don't communicate that centric relation record. So when you're trying to treat TMJ, you're trying to treat these disorders, and you're trying to really disengage these masticatory muscles, you really need to find a way to capture a centric record, translate that, and then make your, your splint or your appliance to, to match that. So there's a lot of difficulty in communicating centric occlusion. Um, there's a number, number of different problems also that, that can result from like asymmetric premature dental contact. So making sure that you communicate this centric relation is very important. So well, we're going to kind of dive in a little bit further into how we communicate bite, reg, uh, bite relation. My ideal typically is to actually have the patient already opened up and then they'll, they'll communicate that. It, it's much easier nowadays, especially with scanners. Um, again, centric relation, when you want to translate this, you want to either use like a, a little, some kind of a leaf gauge, open it up, put some kind of material there just to hold the bite open and then scan. If you're taking a traditional impression, then you'll send these bite registrations so we can mount those. Um, the other problem with digital bite registrations, of course, uh, centric occlusion re relations. And, uh, you know, every patient ideally would be given a face bow and you'd be mounting those on a full size articulator. But I mean, I do full mouth rehabs. So I, I think I can count on one hand how many times I got, I've gotten a face bow record for those types of cases. So it's almost impossible or, or to expect any kind of face bow record for a simple splint. Um, again, so what we end up with is a bite registration record usually in close over hand articulating. And it's, it's acceptable because you know, it's, it's the, the jaw muscles are very forgiving and you get away with a lot. It's acceptable, but not ideal, right? The nice thing about doing these things digitally though, however, is that every case is mounted virtually on a full size articulator. So if you get that centric occlusion record opened up with the leaf gauge, then you're much closer to what the patient has in the mouth rather than what we experienced in the past. Uh, typically what you had in the past was you'd have impressions, you put it in the mouth, then you'd mount them on like a simple hinge brass articulator, right? And that articulator doesn't translate that one millimeter to three millimeter anterior posterior opening arc of closure relation properly. So appliances created this way result in splints where it's very heavy uh, in the posterior at delivery and usually either very light or uh, almost completely open in the anterior. So what this results in is the dentist then needs to spend more time adjusting and grinding the posterior areas until you have full occlusion everywhere. Uh, and then it leaves the distal areas very compromised. And then, you know, uh, over time, these things fail. So I, of course, use three shape. Uh, there are a whole bunch of other softwares that, that you can use to make splints. Uh, but of course, in three shape, you do have this, the full size articulator. You get that nice 110 millimeter relation, intracondylar relation with the bond mold triangle. Uh, so you can mount those models on there and you, you get much closer to that final result with the excursive movements and checking everything. And this ultimately results in, of course, increased patient comfort, better compliance, and ultimately, you know, better relief and less excessive wear for the patient. So we've done hundreds, if not thousands of these at this point, and the thinness of these printed materials, the thermoplastic qualities, the durability, even at those thin, thin, super, super thin one and a half millimeter designs, the patients love them, dentists love them, and our, our, te our technicians absolutely love producing them just because they're so much easier. Again, going back to that figure of that uh, articulator, please, please, please pay special attention to that arc of closure, right? In this uh, diagram here, you'll see that the one arc of closure is not nearly as rapid as the one from the full size. And it, it doesn't mimic the natural opening of, of what a patient would actually have. So what happens is, and, and in the past, uh, I butt heads with a whole bunch of people in, in the lab as well, just because we designed something traditionally, you know, technicians, we like to check things on the, on the, the model. We like to mount them. We want to make sure everything grinds and fits and that's, that it's verified. So what we do is we give this to our finishers in the removal department, and then they're grinding the occlusion away and they're going, hey, you guys design these completely off. It, does, it doesn't match at all. We like the articulators way off. And we'd show them on the computer and we'd say, hey, you know what? It, it looks just fine to me. But um, ultimately they, they'd grind it and they'd check it. And so we'd go back and forth, back and forth. So I finally made up an executive decision. I said, you know what? We're gonna print two copies of these things and I'm going to 
send one to the dentist directly straight out of the printer. We're just going to remove the supports, polish it and off we go. And then you guys finish one, grind it and we'll do it. And we did that for about a month. And the feedback came back that anything that came straight off of the printer was actually better fitting than the ones that we were grinding and checking them out. So what you need to do is you really need to have faith in the design, right? Because the way, if you're not mounting and checking these on an identical articulator, you don't have the same angle. You don't have it at the same position, 110 millimeters away from that condyle. It's not going to correspond in your contacts. You're going to be off. So now what we, nowadays what we do is we just have a working model just to check undercuts, anything that we may need to relieve, but we don't check occlusion anymore because they just drop in. Uh, so we're going to kind of go through really quickly uh, some of the challenges in the past uh, of like when you were doing it in the past, you'd have to fabricate them by hand. You'd either do it by, by pouring, by a salt and pepper method or pouring acrylic, packing acrylic. And you'd work with these materials in like a very doughy stage and you're checking with the articulator, working at a pretty brisk pace, right? Because you find that, uh, and then once it's done, it's all set. And then you got to go put it in a pressure pot, whatever, cure it. And a lot of times these materials, they're, they're also have like a hygroscopic uh, quality where they repel water. So you'd actually have to pre-dry these materials almost up to an hour before uh, you'd, you'd actually start working with them. So it's very time consuming, very technique sensitive, very uh, labor intensive, like very, you have to be very focused. Whereas, you know, 3D printed resins, you can get cleaner, better results, no monomer smells, no mess, no porosity from air bubbles escaping from the model because you didn't soak it all the way. Um, all the software surveys your models for you, blocks out any undercuts for you. Your video, if ideally you get a centric record that's already open, but if you're opening the video, it's gonna be much closer even on that large articulator virtually. And it's not time sensitive, right? If I click a couple of splints, I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna go get an espresso, go walk away, go have an extended lunch. I'm a little bit frustrated with my computer right now. I can come back two hours later, continue working on those splints. You're no longer at the mercy of the material itself. And again, with digital, I'm, I'm lazy. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge advocate of being lazy. You're putting in less effort and you're getting away with a lot less labor, right? Uh, nowadays, also labor shortages. I've, I'm sure a lot of people are experiencing this as well, but finding a good removable technician is, is very challenging nowadays. So rather than trying to find someone you could spend and, you know, spend massive amounts of time investing in the recruiting process, getting them in, and maybe it doesn't even work out, spend that money on a 3D printer, right? It, it'll work weekends, it'll work evenings, echoing exactly what Tanya was saying earlier. It will work holidays, it doesn't call in sick unless you know you stop calibrating it, you're spilling resin all over, then your printer is going to feel a little bit sick, but just clean it up with some alcohol, you'll be fine. So again, these printers, they're scalable, scalable, automatable, all your processes, it allows you to produce at scale, right? So you have the capacity for it. And then uh, you'll quickly realize a lot of time savings, a lot of, a lot of the materials that end up going into the, the trash by bulk trimming, all this excess, so you're at the bench grinding things away. And you know, you're, you're at the end, you look like a Scarface movie with you know, powder floating all over the place, right? So it's, it's not pretty, again, it's much cleaner. It's much more civilized experience, I find. So and also in the past, I found that splints have been a loss leader for us because typically when a, a dentist is trying out a new lab, they'll, they won't send you, you know, a crown or a veneer, they'll send you a splint or like a retainer or something like that. So we don't focus on our removables really. We've always priced it pretty much at cost and splints have actually been a loss leader in the past. But because these processes are scalable, automatable, they've slowly started to become a, a profit center for us now that we were doing these things digitally and so much more efficiently. So you can do some real quick math here. I'm not gonna go too, too much into it, but basically when you break down these things, I don't wanna mo like spend too much time on the slide here uh, just because we're a little bit tight for time, but a one kilogram bottle of uh, key splint slop, that's my um, resin of choice is about $600 Canadian. Uh, the corresponding traditional uh, powder and liquid that we use for like a thermoflex splint you're about $10 per splint uh, when you do traditionally, about $12 Canadian uh, when you do it digitally. So the prices are very comparable. Again, once you scale these things, it, it, it works out and it, it makes a lot, a lot of a sense. And just that little bit of difference is practically neg negligible. Uh, but it's not just the raw material cost. You have other capital investment, right? You have all these, all these traditional processing equipment, all these uh, auxiliary things that you need to have. But of course, in digital, you also need to have scanners, uh, digital licenses, 3D printers, post-processing equipment. So there, there is capital investment cost to, to both. And then of course you have your computer, monitor, keyboard, mouse, 
all, all these things that you need to do, uh, whatever system uh, software that you may be using, ExoCAD, uh, D3 Splint, Blender, uh, whatever you prefer, uh, you, can, you can use it to, to make a splint. And then of course, once you finish these things, like traditionally, uh, you either use some burrs or some uh, scotch bright wheels just to polish them up a little bit, and then you buff and high shine them. And then for some final points, I just wanted to focus, touch on the, the materials themselves that we use to print and, and give you guys kind of some insight into the material science and engineering behind these resins. And of course, uh, resin is this thick mystery fluid that you just pour into your printer, you press a button, and a little while later you come back and you have this printed part, right? That's great. And some of you may not care at all about what's inside the resin, but I find that understanding the core components, uh, these fundamental building blocks, uh, it really helps you with troubleshooting and really taking advantage of the technology and the materials uh, when you're trying to solve some problems or whenever you encounter something. So understanding that these resins aren't, aren't these just homogenous fluids, right? That separation of these materials occurs pretty readily. So it, it, it makes you appreciate the need to really mix and agitate and stir these resins constantly prior to printing. So you get better results and less fail, failed prints and more consistent uh, repeatable results time and time again. So of course, what are the core components of a photopolymer resin? You have, of course, uh, in dental, a lot of us are familiar with that lovely smell of monomer. It has that distinctive smell and it's used all the time in traditional methods for all those as an initiator for acrylics. In resin, monomers, oligomers, uh, they act in very much the same way. They're molecules, of course, and they're the building blocks for the resin, right? So when these kick off a little reaction, they form these long chains uh, called polymers and this process is called polymerization. And they form these long chains, and that's how we end up building these 3D printed parts. But we need to start this reaction somehow, right? So that's what these photo initiators, uh, that's where they come in. These are kind of like really the brains and the activator of the resin. So photo initiators, they're the, the molecules that are sensitive, uh, they absorb UV light, and then they convert that energy into this chemical reaction that kickstarts that polymerization process. And then finally, of course, we have these pigments and dyes and all these other additives that uh, you find inside the the resin stabilizers, things like that, that make it more viscous or thinner or flow or depending on whatever the resin manufacturer wants that resin to do, right? So some of these components, they make the resin more shelf stable or they're added so the final print can have a certain desirable uh, appearance or color. Uh, so what's important also to note is that the post-processing protocol for these photopolymer resins needs to correspond to these materials, right? So a good post-cure is equally as important as the printing process itself. Uh, most of the resins that, that especially Asiga work with, their manufacturers, the manufacturers really work to validate these resins, optimize the post-processing protocols, and typically what you'll find is in the IFU is sufficient. You don't really need to worry too much about tinkering with the post-curing uh, process. And then finally, I'm going to touch on the, a little bit of the background of CAD CAM splints, digital splints, and how it's kind of progressed over the years. And previously, the only reliable way to do these things in a digital way was to mill it. And you, you had also these first generation splint materials, but they weren't very good because they had a poor absorption rate. And one thing I was really emphasized with pretty much any print direct print application is its sorption characteristic, right? So it's a characteristic that you want to look at to determine how much Re the resin absorbs from its environment. So milled splints, of course, have an excellent absorption rate. Uh, they, they're not porous at all. The major downside, of course, to milling a splint is you have to mill a splint. It takes you hours and hours where you could be making lots and lots of money milling crowns or whatever else with your milling machine rather than a single splint. Uh, these printed resins, the first generation ones especially, they had very poor absorption. They and then it would ultimately result in failures, breakages, uh, and they just ended up looking really nasty, brittle, and breakdown. And even back then, to pass the regulatory requirements, they were much higher than they were actually today. It was 68 micrograms per cubic meter absorption, and these resins barely even passed those. Since then, they've actually brought, dropped those regulatory requirements, so that it's more stringent. It's 32 micrograms now, uh, but the second generation, again, they just barely passed it. It wasn't as great then. Nowadays, we finally moved on to splints that are in the, the third generation. Uh, these are like the key splint line, key print line, a couple other uh, resins as well that, that are really, really have excellent qualities, excellent wear characteristics, elongation or break, all that stuff. And this third generation is where I think, you know what, now we can really start recommending these um, for long-term use. And, and they've been fantastic and they've far exceeded the, the strength and durability requirements for, for long-term use. 
So with that, again, I'd like to say thank you to Asiga, the Corey Graham, the Asiga Dental Experts Group, everybody. And hopefully you joined today and you learned some excellent stuff, not just from myself, but from everybody else as well. And uh, if there's anything else you guys want to discuss, feel free to connect with me online after the fact uh, via email, social media. And I think we'll uh, go to the, the panel discussion now. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks for that, Min. Um, it's always good listening to you present. Um, and again, thank you for every, every one of our speakers today. Um, I think, yeah, Min's already done the intro. Let's, let's get into it. There's some questions for, for all of you. Um, so just one moment, let me bring, let me just bring them up. I'll pull that back down. Um, so going right, right back to the, the beginning, I know that there's, um, the, there have been some questions that have been answered in the Q and a section. So thanks guys for jumping in and answering some of those, um, for, for Ashley, they, they've asked, so from, um, the question reads, Ashley, so from intraoral scan to try in. And then no, without a bite registration. So would you go straight to a try-in without a bite registration? I mean, it, it depends on what, what data you've got. Um, so the case I showed there, you, you had, you know, you had the pre-op. That's why we always encourage our customers to do the pre-op with the scan. So when the teeth are extracted, I don't have to do a bite registration because I can reference it. Um, so like, this is why I always encourage my customers to always scan the palate, always scan the lingual, the soft tissue. The more reference points you've got, the more you can do. But yeah, sometimes we do have to do a bite block. There's no information. You've just got to do that. But if you can encourage your customers to get that information, it, it just streamlines the process. Yeah. Um, and which for for the temporary um, for the temporary bridges that you've done or temporary try-ins, what materials have you used um, and tested? Oh crikey, loads of them. Um, <laughs> We've been doing, we've been using a, a Swiss material. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, DTAX has been good. We did loads of GC material. Um, yeah, I mean, it tends to be the, 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 the DTAX stuff and the GC are the two that we use. We tend to get the best results with those. I like, I, I, I find the GC a little bit stronger personally, but actually the DTAX I think is, I find it more aesthetic. You can make them thin at the inside of the layers. They actually give a nice level of translucency. Um, so yeah, that's what we're using for the time being. Yeah, okay. And have you tried any of the permanent? There's some new permanent crown materials that have come to market. I think DTAX or DTAX have launched one as well. Have you tried that? Yeah, we've been using the, the Swiss one. Um, uh, for, for me at the moment, it, it's whilst I love, you know, the 3D printing and it's much more efficient. My problem is, is that anything that permanent has kind of got to be multi-layered. Um, so the option I've got is there is that I, I print it and then I manually cut it back and manually layer it, or I can just mill it in, in a multi-block PMMA. So for me, we're still milling PMA, time consuming. I, I wish we could print it, um, but we can't. But certain cases, you know, that there are, we've got a few of our customers now have got a Seegers and, and they are using the more definitive materials as temps, long-term temps. And I, I, I scan them in my lab, send them to them and they just print them chair side. And they are getting much better results than I am because they're chair side, they're just looking for a long-term temp and those materials seem to be working really, really well. Yeah. Okay. Cool. The the Swiss company is that Ceramco. Yes, that's it. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. Thanks for that, Ashley. Um, to Marcus, when printing the model for verification, what layer thicknesses are you printing at? At fifty microns. At fifty microns. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll just add to that. I think that the um, we we find that if you've got anything for restorative or needs a really nice fit, we recommend fifty micron layers for yeah. anything that is less or is maybe more compliant in the mouth, um, you can look to 100 microns. Uh, but if you've, it, it, for, for the for really nice fit, 50 micron layers is, um, is good. And which, which uh, materials are you using for on your um, printer, Marcus, for, for models, for, for any other applications that you're printing? Oh, well, we try a lot of materials, but models mainly in um, a Sika center model. And we have also DTAX, we have next end materials here. We have, uh, wow, a whole bunch of them. But uh, without any troubles, uh, go with a Sika. It's the dental model, it just prints every time. It's really, it's the best material out there. So also the color of it, it's just, when I saw it for the first time, I was like, wow, that's it. 
And for the temporary 3 prints, uh, we use GC temp. It's a nice material. Mm. We have also Detox here, temporary materials, but GC is my favorite. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, <clears throat> we've got a we've got a few questions around dentures, and I think there's there's um one which is really to the panel. Um, oh, I'll ask I'll ask one to to Tanya first. I think some of these have been answered, um, but just to share them with every the the viewers. Um, what is the for Tanya? What is the lifespan, ballpark lifespan of a digital denture? I know that you've asked for more information, whether it be printed or milled. Um, but for a, for a three D printed denture, what would be a typical lifespan? How long would your patients typically use them for at home? Well, and so there's a lot of variables to that, of course, um, mm -hmm. because we do continue to manage the patient care, you know, intraorally managing the, the fit, which is huge, and the occlusion. You know, I think people are going to run into issues with breakage if the bite is off or if they're not managing the fit. So, I, you know, we have a patient, uh, she's at least six to nine months into her original. We've had to re redesign it, reprint it initially just to make some changes to the aesthetics and modify the bite, but she's, we actually talked about it this morning in our meeting to get her back because she's still continuing to wear it. So I feel like I wouldn't have a patient wear one more than a year, but materials are still, they're just getting better and better every day. And that conversation will change next year. I'm sure when we talk about this. Yeah, uh, I wonder that, that there are, that, yeah, there's lots of variables, aren't there? And I, mm -hmm. with, with the way that you design the denture, and I suppose this is a this is across all appliances really that are worn. Um, with the design of the denture, have you adjusted the design um, so thickening up areas, certain areas of the? I know you were talking earlier about how you can you know really cut out a lot of material, so mm -hmm. you can almost get a nominal wall thickness throughout the whole denture. Yeah. But do, do you have you have you learned as you've gone on areas to maybe make the denture more robust um so thickening up certain sections of the, de the denture so they'd last longer in the in the and with the patient yeah i i feel initially as soon as the patient gets in into their immediate like we you know i really push the limits in terms of the the thickness of these um we will continue to see them and we can add that chair side reline material which is going to add an extra little layer of strength you know that's going to buy us some time to get them through some healing and it's going to slowly allow the patient to get used to maybe a traditionally uh, traditional size, the thickness of the base. So, you know, I when they first get their immediate dentures, they're not going to be biting uh, hard things. They're going to be on a soft diet. So really, we just want to have it act like a big band-aid and just ease them into a full denture concept. So we we can kind of push the limits a little bit with the thickness and, and increase that as we reline or take the impression and then rescan that and maybe up the thickness to two millimeters at that point. So that's the beauty of the digital dentures and the printing, the parameters, there's lots of options. Yeah, okay, thanks. And what, with the, this really goes out to everyone. Um, and it was regarding dentures and try-ins and it's back, it's, it sort of relates to the one of the previous questions that we've, uh, we've answered, but um with dentures and try-ins do you print at 100 microns or would you speed the printers up and print at 75 to 100 microns so so i i would be printing my printed immediates at 50 um anything else trays anything like that would be 100 okay does anyone have any other setup that they that they use yeah, um, I'll chime in here. So I'm a notorious procrastinator. So if I have time, I'll do 50. But if I need it done quick, I'll do it at 175. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, there's a it's it's a it's an interesting point that I think there's a there's obviously you want to you want to try and achieve the the best possible outcome from the printer. That um, and I, I don't want this. Uh, there's been there's there's been lots of nice friendly plugs for our products here, and I thank everyone for that. I I, I want this to be like an obviously education for people to have lots of takeaways. There is a 
There is a feature in a Sega composer called um, multi-range and you can print objects. I think Min, you're, you, you've, you did a webinar with us recently yeah. and you'll be talking about this at LMT um, with, with Keystone um, about using that feature for multi-material um, appliances, but you can use multi-range to. Um, <laughs> I don't think you saw that. Yeah. Oh. It was like, oh. Damn. No, it's, it's fine. It's fine. It's, it's no cool. surprise really to anybody, but you know, come to Chicago, you'll see me talk. About some, some new yeah. Oh, jeez. There you go. <laughs> moving, moving on quickly, multi range is used to print objects at various different layer thicknesses throughout the same object. So you can you can print the 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 key areas that are there for fit in the 50 microns, then you can move through the rest of the model at um, a, a thicker layer thickness. Um, so there's a multi-range can be used. So you, you know, you can either pick a standard layer thickness, a nominal layer thickness throughout an object, or you can work on multiple, um, multiple layer thicknesses. Um, Tanya, which resin are you printing for trays? Uh, it is the... OptiPrint Dentona, I believe. The Dentona OptiPrint, okay. Um, for men, um, do you do you try any material for splint which is to become flexible into the mouth, such as from Shoy? So I, I think that's a material that will maybe yeah, soften so, so as well. Material, yeah, my material of choice, of course, is Keysplint Soft. Um, it's it's the best one I've found in, in my experience. Um, we've done thousands of them. It can be printed as thin as a millimeter and a half. Um, we design them super, super thin. And it has, once it reaches that body temperature, it just kind of softens up. And it, it's very nice. Patients really like it. And it, it doesn't really, it's, it's very comfortable. Okay, thanks. Um, I see I see Ashley was shaking his head as well. And so Ashley, I, I imagine you use the key splint soft a lot too. Yeah, we, we actually, we refuse to print in any other material now and we don't know, that's it. If you want, if you want to splint from us, it's Keystone soft or find another lab, simple as that. <laughs> <laughs> and have you tried, <laughs> have, you, have you used the hard material as well from Keystone? If it, do you yeah, offer the yeah. two options yet? Yeah, we do. We do actually. I mean, if you, there are certain cases where I think the hard material is, is needed, it's required. There's certain types of splints that we use where the soft one doesn't work. But for a general, uh, you know, sort of Michigan Tanner style splint, it will always be Keystone soft. But yeah, that the only two materials we offer now is is the soft and the hard, and that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I think um, yeah, Key, Keystone is still when they launched that material. I think it was it 2019 when that came out. Or was it 17? 19. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's still today, just uh yeah, it, it still leads the leads the the field, you know. It's which is which is kudos to them for sure. Um Tanya, with 3D printing, with 3D printed dentures, which resins have you tried? I think you've mentioned dent care. Are there any yeah. other dent denture? denture-based materials that you've printed? Well, we've used uh, Nextint quite a bit in the beginning. Um, you know, a few years ago when we first got into this, uh, we, we had some colleagues, uh, they were all about the, the Nextint printers and, and we ended up acquiring some resin and, and using it. I, mean, I feel like it worked pretty good. Um, we do have the Denco denture base as well, uh, but our go-to is definitely the Drev. Um, the transparent one is one that we do like, the opaque. It's just... Uh, I don't know. It looks like bubble gum. I, I, I like the I like the transparency uh, of the draft. So we've tried a few different ones. Those are our go tos. Okay. Den denture oh. base, yeah. Denka denture tea. But we're limited. Our our resin selections. You know, we don't have a ton of options in Canada. No. Yeah. Tony, do you, do you do a custom tray for every patient? Uh, let's you. You, you showed us the material you use, but do you do it for every patient or is it only particular cases you always do a, uh, a, uh, a custom tray and then you don't do it for others? 
Uh, well, we have four clinicians here and they all do things differently. Um, a lot of times what we can do is scan if the dentures are, have got uh, de decent landmarks, we can, we can take those dentures and just scan them as a triple tray to produce a new uh, preliminary uh, functional try and set up. And then what we'll do is we'll take impressions in those in the mouth and use that as a custom tray on the new design. Uh, but typically we will always do a printed base plate and or a printed uh, close fitting tray. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. The, um, I, we just had another question come through for men, I believe, and uh, Ashley as well, perhaps. Um, what angle do you print your key splint, uh, soft splints at? Um, so it's kind of like a 45-ish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. kind of like a 45-ish, yeah. Just, <laughs> it gives you the best of both worlds. A little bit of speed and, you know, not a lot of pulling forces. Make sure you use the low force trays. Another plug there, Graham. Um, so, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, use the low force trays <laughs> to, to help fight against those pulling forces and you'll get nice results. You would think that we were like paying every time somebody put in a plug, <laughs> but we're really not. Just so all the viewers know. Um, we also got another question in that's, and maybe this would be a good one for Graham, perhaps. And it was any updates on Lucitone for a SEGA? Um, but then they put, is this resin really better than anything else? And so I think um, Ashley may have some experience with the material firsthand. Mm -hmm. And then Graham, if you want to talk about, you know, the Lucitone, Death Supply Lucitone material, and if it's, uh, uh, I guess, the statuses of that currently. Yeah, so the, the validation of um, the loose tone digital print system for the Asiga Max is available now. Um, so that's all been validated. The Pro 4K is, is it's coming. It's, I think we're, the, the last update was that it's, it's probably maybe another four weeks away. Um, so yeah, the, the, the validation is there for the Max UV. So it's all good to go. Um, as far as an application perspective, um, I think that's probably best answered by um, Ashley. I know Ashley, you, you've you, you're using. I'm not sure if you've used that yet in your maxes, but I uh, believe no. you're using that on your carbons. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, and we do a lot yeah. of them. Um, and I have yet to find a better material. Um, you know, we've tried every denture material on the market. Uh, the looser tone is is another level. Uh, we're not getting any failures, any fractures. I think I've had two fractures, but they're immediate. What should have probably been relined after a period of time uh, but no it is a phenomenally good material and I think exposing it out into the world at the moment obviously it's a bit of a carbon sort of exclusive the fact it's now getting out into other printers that that just pushes it pushes the material you know it's going to be great and I'm really keen to, to see this appearing in other printers uh, but from my perspective yeah I have yet to use better uh, and it's the only material I will use for a denture at this moment in time. So cool. Ashley does it require its own curing unit? Yeah, unfortunately it does which makes it flipping expensive um whether that's marketing or what i don't know but from our perspective yes they won't validate it without that um at the moment they're not they're only validated on full fulls they're not validated on partials i do more partials with it than i do fulls um and um it's working really well but yes to, to have the full validated workflow you do need their their particular curing device unfortunately and that's an important um, topic, actually. I think that when we get asked this a lot, um, because it, there are lots of materials now, our library has over 500 validated profiles. Um, and there are lots of material, um, there's lo lots of post curing units as well. So, you know, the last thing you, that anybody wants is to have a, a, a rack full of curing units. Um, so we always get asked whether I can use this curing unit for this material. And the simple answer is you need to always refer to the material manufacturer's IFU. You should never really deviate away from that because if you deviate away from that, you, you're then producing a non-compliant product. Those IFUs have been written specifically to make sure that the end product that goes into the patient's mouth is safe and suitable for in the mouth use or in contact with the body. So um, yeah, I just wanted to add that because there's a question earlier about um, cleaning clear parts and and I think that that's really, it's a very difficult question for anybody to ask one without without knowing the mat which material it is, but then it's ultimately, it needs to be asked to the material manufacturer. 
because they are the ones. It, it comes down to how long you how long you wash it in the cleaning solution um, uh, through to, you know, it's just all the handling from um, pouring it into the printer to um, what you do with it after it's printed. So they're always best to go back to the material manufacturers. There was an interesting point earlier um, that you made, Tanya, about the finishing of dentures. And it it's really interesting for us to see this because I mentioned earlier that we're across multiple industries. One of our big industries out with a market leader in um, the audiology sector for 3D printing hearing aids, custom hearing aids. So if, you've, if you wear a custom hearing aid in the UK, if you wear a custom hearing aid in the US or in Canada, probably Iceland as well, there's a, I'd say there's a 90% chance it's been printed on a Sega printer. Um, there's the because we so we support satellite production centers for the big labs across all of those regions, and they have they've been doing this for about 30 years 3D printing custom hearing aids, and they've got some really unique post processing techniques. There's one which I've, we've seen recently with Graphy, the clear aligner material, where they don't wash in IPA, they use a centrifuge to spin off any excess resin and then they cure it, and then that. By doing that, you leave a thin film of resin on the surface of the part and it's nice and glossy at the end. Or they um, paint on some of the same material, again, like you mentioned earlier, Tanya, and then post-cure it again with that. So you're basically glazing the object with the same material. So there's a, it's really interesting. I'm really happy to see that you're doing that because that's it's a well-known, tried and tested technique that's been used in the audio sector for a very long time now. Um, yeah, so I think a big concern, that. a big concern with the printed dentures for for a lot of colleagues uh, was the, the staining aspect. They just threw in the towel because it would just come back and it would look horrible, right? Because the finishing on it wasn't correct. So we've we've problem solved that, and I it's I hope everybody can continue to do that because that's what's going to allow the patient to wear it for for longer. Mm. Yeah. I have a question for Marcus uh, real quick. So in your in your presentation, Marcus, you were showing the different aspects that you designed with ExoCAD, and then it showed your doctor was scanning with 3Shape. And then, of course, you use uh, a Sega composer for your 3D printer. Um, do you, I guess you're, you're using three different completely softwares. Are you running into any issues with communication between the three years? Everything... Uh, almost like a seamless ecosystem. I mean, all three of those softwares are, are considered open. You know, I guess what what type of hurdles have you encountered, and how did you overcome them? If you did, if you did encounter any. So far, none. The only one thing is with free shape, I don't get the color on the scans, but <clears throat> for me, it's not important. I use my I just use ExoCut how the color is, and it's perfect for me. So, but no big issues now. SDL is the SDL. Yeah, easy. That's an easy answer. <laughs> awesome. The uh, let me see. I think there's only uh, the for Ashley for your for your um, screw retain restorations. It showed that you were printing them. I think it was like 43 minutes or so. Was that printed in 100 micron layers, or were you printing that in 50 micron layers? Oh, uh, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, the reason I say that is that my team printed those. Um, I've been up to my eyes in it this week because I'm off to Chicago next week. Um, yeah. I'll find out for you. I think um, I think there were 100 microns because one of those had to go in the post. And again, it's exactly like Miriam said, it's, you know, sometimes you need these things fast. And, uh, you know, accuracy of these is not critical. I'm looting this onto cylinders. You know, so most most commonly we'll do them 100 microns just to get them out quick and fast. You know, I mean, if they're sitting there overnight, I'll put them on 50. Um, but yeah. if they're going out quick, yeah, well, I need to print them for something else. So I'll, I'll bash them out quick. Okay, cool. Awesome. And whilst, the, um, whilst I've, sorry, I've got, whilst Ashley's on his, well, I think he's back on his front foot. I was going to catch him while he's still on his back foot then. But <laughs> when, when, when you're designing, and this is for Ashley and me or anyone else as well, but with them, what is the minimum wall thickness that you're happy with with your splints? So we'll start with Ashley and I'll be interested to know what Min um, says as well. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, we're the same. I think you know, one and a half mil is kind of the minimum we would go to. Um, I, I believe you, we tend to go a little bit thicker than that. But again, it's case dependent. If I've got a very small, petite mouth, we'll go one and a half. If I've got a great big, huge mouth and I can see the patient is going to grind through that in a matter of weeks, we'll go thicker. I think you've got to do it case dependent personally. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't have much to add beyond that. Officially, it's one and a half. I mean, if if they have really, really pointy cusps and you don't want a really bulky opening on the anterior, we've gone down to one. I didn't say that, but, <laughs> and it's been fine, right? And I mean, if you need to reprint one for the patient, again, it's that one button remake, toss it over to the dentist, off it goes. So it, it, it's really not a big deal. And you just need to thicken a little bit more. So it's, it's, it's really not, not that much. Okay, cool. Um, well, I think I'm sort of, I think, um, we've covered most things. There are some other questions which we've the, the sort of covered already in the in what we've already spoken about. And we're coming up to we've got about five minutes left. So I reckon um, it might be a good idea to give some. Do we call it swag, or do we just call it free stuff? Some cool merch. Stuff. We can call it free merch. swag. Merch. Yeah. That's the merch. Yeah. Oh, merchandise. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, okay, so Ken has been um, behind the scenes, um, ready to scramble some um, scramble some names. So before you announce, Ken, we've got a little bit of a drum roll, but I'm. Um, the third prize that we're giving away is a bottle of a Sega resin, um, a, a bill tray to go with that and a storage case to um, store the tray in. And um, one of our very fashionable dental experts t-shirts. Thanks to those that wore them today. That's very good of you. Um, so Ken, are you ready to pull somebody's name out of the hat? Yeah, let me... Uh... Thanks for everyone who did stick around. So I'll be doing quick rotation or randomization. All right, I'll just I'll just play a drum roll. All right, we're ready. <laughs> it is, okay. All right. So sorry. There's no drum roll. roll. There is another. Oh, oh, hang on. <laughs> hang on. Wait a minute. I've I've. We Technical did, difficulty. We Again, <laughs> the longest run roll. roll. Uh, hang on. The drum roll is the most important part. This is the most important part. I, I was pretty happy when, when the team put this together for me, and I, I can't not share it. So give me a minute. The, it didn't work because the, the system crashed. So just sorry about that. Let me, let me do that again. So, Ken, are you are you ready? Oh, you're ready for third place. We we yeah, we are ready for third place. So, so uh, it will be Miko Poranen. Miko, yes, okay. I believe Miko awesome. here. Congratulations, yeah. Pico. Yeah, congratulations. So we'll 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 be in touch with you after the webinar, and we'll we'll get so we'll get those prizes over to you. And um, for the second prize is five kilos of material, mm -hmm. so five bottles. You know, choose any bottle of a Sega material that you like, including all. You know, we'll throw in some trays for that also, and the storage cases and another one of those T-shirts. So. I'm going to play the drum roll while you pick that out, Ken. All right, go for it. Uh, Jennifer Taylor, congratulations on your five kilograms of material. Cool. Nice. What was it? I didn't, I didn't hear it. Jennifer Taylor. Oh, okay, cool. Awesome. And the first prize is 10 kilos of resin um, and the, some trays and some storage cases, so 10 trays and 10 storage cases. 
So Ken, scramble those names. <laughs> Well, you're going to have to get someone with big muscles to get that uh, box for you. Who was it? What name was that again, Ken? Hoyle Ken. Hoyle Ken. Okay, cool. Great. So we'll be in touch with all of those um, people at the end of the, um, just after this webinar. Um, so really, all, the, all that's left from, from my side is to, if I just... There we go. So I'd just like to say thank you everyone for joining. And again, thank you to the Asiga Dental Experts founder, Matthias Zimmerer, to all the admins in the group and all of those that are members in that forum. It's, a, it's an awesome group and we really hope that you keep, you know, the energy in there um, moving along as we yeah, keep bringing you 3D printing technology and materials. So thanks again to all of our speakers as well. And I wish you all um, a really successful 2022. And for those visiting LNT Lab Day, we look forward to seeing you there. Um, so thanks again, everyone. Thanks everybody for joining. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, guys. Thanks. Nice to be here. See you all soon. See you.